So thank you for coming. I'm Jared Beaton. I'm one of the Earth Science Professors, and I get the honor of uh, introducing Jamie Sutton and Deacon Aspinwall. They've both been doing research with me at these different mammoth sites here in the San Luis Valley. And they were out on four different sites this past summer, and they're going to present on two of them. So let's welcome Jamie and Deacon. All right. Thank you, Dr. Beaton. All right, so I'm Jamie Sutton, Deacon Aspinwall, and our research is on the geoarchaeology that we did last summer on early humans at two of the sites, Scott Miller and Mr. Pete site within the valley. So pretty much the background of what we did uh, last summer is uh, about seven students or so, kind of depending on the day, uh, would go out to whatever site we were at for that week. So it was a total of four weeks over the summer where we did all this research. And we would do pretty much uh, soil surveys by uh, digging trenches and whatnot, but also we got to look into the anthropology and archaeology aspect of it also, which was not really our field. So it was great experience for learning not only research in our own field, but getting a glimpse into other fields and connecting the geoarchaeology with that. At the, oh, sorry. So we got a grant from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the lead archaeologist was Steve Holland for the Villa Grove site, which we will not be talking about. And we also worked with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The lead archaeologist was made Venice and she um, helped us out a lot and actually we helped her out a lot too with the trenches that we dug in. She'll be helping us next summer as well. So um, the purpose of our research was to determine uh, where there might be the archaeological potential for finding pre-Clovis human remains in the San Luis Valley. Um, so Clovis people are generally accepted by archaeologists as the first group of people to inhabit the New World. Um, and that was, you know, 13,000 years before present uh, plus or minus. Um, there's been a growing amount of evidence supporting that there were people here before the Clovis people. Um, from Patagonia in South America uh, to Oregon um, and even some potential evidence in the San Luis Valley. And that's kind of what got this whole project started. Um, so the research that we're doing has the potential to um, add to this list of evidence. One of the important distinctions to make though is we weren't necessarily doing the ones excavating for artifacts. We were more so finding the places uh, that archaeologists uh, would choose to dig. So we tell them where to dig. Um, and to do this, uh, we conducted uh, soil stratigraphic field work. We analyzed sediments, um, took samples for carbon-14 dating. Um, and all of these just help us put together a picture of what the environment would have been like 13,000 years before present and older um, to help us find these locations and environments where these people would have uh, been uh, living and hunting and things like that. Uh, here is uh, just a brief uh, image of the four different sites that uh, we research. Um, here is the Scott Miller and here is the Mr. Pete site. Um, if any of you guys went to uh, any of the talks yesterday, uh, Kyle Beefus and Patrick Ortiz did a talk on sites C and D, which are the Magna and Villa Grove. Um, What's interesting is all four of these sites have uh, something to do with water. Uh, sites A, B, and C were all paleo wetlands, kind of a bog or marshy environment, lots of water. Uh, and then site D uh, was not a bog, but it, it had a, a stream, a perennial stream. And, um, and so once again, water was associated with that. All right, so the sites that were picked were not like just randomly chosen in the valley. They had to, it required specific characteristics in order to be of relevance uh, geography wise and archeology span wise. So a big characteristic was we were looking at these stratified sediments. So these layered materials, each layer has its own characteristic that tells us something about that time frame. So when it changes, then you're going to get a different layer. So based on those layers and then the organic material and content in it, we can date it. So if there's an artifact in that layer, 
when we date the soil, we have the date of the artifact. Uh, the occupation, pretty much, uh, we have over 10,000 years of points, uh, especially at the Scott Miller site, there are about 160 points collected. So you have a huge time frame for one location. Those are just um, a small area of that paleo wetland that was looked over. There's still a whole lot of work that needs to be done. So if we have evidence for that large of a time frame, what's to say that it could not be extended further to pre-Clovis? We just haven't found the evidence yet, but it could still be there. And then these buried soils, part of the stratified sediments, uh, soils, not just dirt, it's actually more specific than that, and it's a lot more, a uh, lot more to it. So, within these soils is pretty much you're getting an exact telling or story of what that paleo landscape was. So, whoever was walking on it at that time, uh, whatever that soil is, it can tell you: was it desert? Was it tropical? Was there a lot of water? Was it really dry? And that actually helps paint a whole picture for the paleo climate of the whole San Luis Valley. So these two top images are of the Mr. Pete and Scott Miller site, are uh, just Google Earth images, remote satellite images, and then the two bottom ones are alternated of the same images. And they're just made to emphasize on the sediments that we were looking at in particular, like the peats and, that top, and the top organic silt layer. So um, one of the biggest uh, goals of this research was to determine what the paleo climate was. Um, these people would have been coming into the valley and um, you know what was what was the weather like? Uh, what attracted them to this area? Um, and that can all be determined from uh, the, the soil and the natures of the soil. Um, so what we did uh, at the Mis Mr. Pete site um, was took a transect which is just a straight line of of holes spaced evenly apart about five meters um, and, and this was done uh, because you can really determine what uh, the sequence of events was. So at the bottom of a pit you might have um, maybe finer sands and then you know maybe 20 meters away you would have um, those sands as well as some larger you know, pebbles and rocks and some larger uh, clasts. Um, and this uh, all helps us to put together a soil profile. Um, once again, it's like a sequence of events, and it just shows us that um, you can see how the environment was changing over time. Um, from these different layers, we took carbon-14 dates, which is really important since really we're trying to focus on sediments that would be older than 13,000 years. Um, and so we need these dates to be able to know if we're digging in the right place. And then uh, the sediment analysis, once again, as Jamie said, uh, really helps us to uh, determine what was the environment that these formed in. And uh, we will go over uh, a more specific uh, description of the sediment, um, uh, sediment analysis. All right, so here we have, uh, at least for the Scott Miller site, uh, one of the trenches that were dug. So this is like a soil profile. We have each layer is basically a changing environment. And so that's why that sediment changes. Uh, abruptly and they're actually very similar to the Mr. Pete site you can actually visibly easily see if you go out into the field where it changes and it has very abrupt boundaries and we'll kind of get more into each layer specifically on the next slides so but pretty much in general oldest on bottom youngest on the top uh, each layer is different for specific reasons Right, so it's a soil summary of the Scott Miller site. So pretty much that first image of the trench that you saw in writing, this summarizes it all up. So our first layer is a fluvial sediment. So fluvial meaning like running water, rivers, creeks. It has a lot more energy than say like a lake that where the water's standing still. So you have bigger class size, pebbles and uh, coarser grain sands. This is actually where uh, some of the bone material was found and there might be a correlation there that we're, we need to look further into. The next layer is the woody peat, which means that there was a significant change in the environment. You went from something was 
an environment that was not really stable to very stable. You have a, a high water table where it's very gentle and a lot of organic material is able to build up and then over time uh, turn into a peat. It was also compacted down and other layers were built on top of it over time. So then environment changes again, you have evaporite silt. So the water table is moving up and down, it's fluctuating a lot, it's lowering, it's rising, and it's doing so rapidly. So you have these uh, class that are small, really soft silt and easily, easy to move by water and especially by wind and it builds up over time. And you have these seasonally dry plies in such an environment. So a ply is a lake that is part of the time it's saturated, the other part of the time it's gonna be wet. So it has a distinct, I guess, layer or layers within its profile that say that it was wet during this season, it was dry during this season. On top of that, you have this organic silt, so it's going to be darker, but still that soft material. Really um, fine, fine sized grains. So paleo playa again, but more organic content, so it makes it a lot darker. And because of the wind in the paleo playa, you also have the presence of lunette dunes downwind. That began. So, not quite the extent of the great sand dunes, but more like miniature dunes. And then on top of that, we have this, I guess, light, fluffy, woody peat because it hasn't, it's the top layer, it hasn't been compacted. And this environment stabilized again, where it's not standing water, it's not flowing really fast, so you have a lot of organic material that builds up. And then over a long period of time, it's undisturbed and it can turn into the peat that we see on top today. So here's an overview of the soils found at the Mr. Peat site. And uh, same as the Scott Miller site, you can see a very uh, clear sequence of events. Um, uh, at the bottom, which is going to be the layer of most interest to the study, is a fluvial sand. Again, it's a, um, a flowing water environment. Uh, and if you imagine, uh, you know, you have all these glaciers on Mount Blanca that are going to be melting and all this uh, glacial meltwater is going to be hitting the valley uh, floor and then meandering through the valley floor until it eventually uh, joins with the Rio Grande. Um, and as it's meandering along, it's, there's going to be parts where it's moving faster and then parts where it's moving slower. Um, in those places where it's moving slower, you're going to find this silty sand, this very, very, very fine material. And then in other places you'll find this, this gravel and, and these cobbles, uh, and that indicates where there was actually more energy, maybe the more, um, the, the main part of the uh, stream that was running through. Uh, and so uh, af uh, after a time, um, there was more saturation in the soil, perhaps a, a rise in the water table, um, and it, it was host to lots of plant material. And these plants would attract large uh, paleofauna like uh, bison and mammoth. And then these would have been the animals that humans traveling through the area would have been hunting. Uh, the, uh, um, the mucky peat layer is called so because it's got a lot of organic material, but it also has a lot of inorganic material like these silts and very fine sediments. Uh, and it's very, you know, very easily smeared, but um, you can still find uh, moss fragments and things like that. Um, above that uh, was a very occasional and sporadic silt lens. So imagine you had a, a river that would occasionally flood its banks and deposit this very thin layer of, uh, of sediments. And then above that, we had the woody peat, which was, it really looked like lawn mulch, you know, lawn mulch. It, uh, very, very obvious plant remains, wood chips, things like that. Um, and it had a, a quite a bit of organic material. And then above that, uh, there's an organic silt layer. So it was very light, um, very, it was uh, light in, in weight and density, but it was very dark, very, you know, black and carbon rich. Uh, and it, it was commonly exposed at the surface and it, um, had a lot of plant material as well as a lot of that fine material, um, and it was very lumpy. There wasn't any stratification to it. 
So you might imagine that there would have been uh, all these small particles of silt and dust-sized particles being blown into a place where there might have been some standing water, and then it builds up over time. Uh, here um, is just an example of some of the, uh, one of the organisms that uh, these pre clovis people would have been hunting. This is the bison uh, antiquus, which is the ancestor of the modern day bison. The, um, the, you can see it's, it's about 15 to 25% larger than the modern bison and it's got very large like Texas longhorn horns. Uh, and here at the Mr. Pete site uh, were two incisors of these uh, bison antiquus. And um, both sites had both bison remains and mammoth remains. So from maybe tooth fragments, or um, I know there were quite a few like leg bones over in the uh, Mr. Pete site. All right. So pretty much the whole point of our research was we're finding this human association. And uh, as Deacon said earlier, that they are all connected to water, uh, specifically these two, to paleo wetlands. And pretty much it's easy to really see why you find artifacts and animal remains here. Uh, water today, as well as back then, water's critical for life to go on. So uh, that plant growth, uh, water as a drink source, it's going to attract animals and the people are going to follow it. So that's why the paleo wetlands are kind of a huge um, theme for trying to find these pre-Clovis remains because it's a very good place to begin looking. So what we have is stratified sediments that support a Clovis age based on the carbon-14 dates thus far. And we have a significant range of points. So over 10,000 years of use. Like I said earlier, if there's 10,000 years of use thus far, why can't it be a little bit further? We just need to find the evidence for it and there's still a lot of area at the site that can be excavated or scoured over. Um, at the Mr. Pete site, um, there was, uh, it's on private property and, and this is really an, an unfortunate thing uh, it was very well, uh, very efficiently picked over by non-scientists. So, you know, amateur collectors, amateur uh, archaeologists went to the site and um, collected points. Uh, I know there was actually a bison kill site with a, a point embedded in the rib cage that was excavated at the site, but not properly documented. And this is a huge blow to the research. Um, and But uh, with all that in mind, uh, we were able to uh, find and collect six points pro properly documented. And um, one of them was of possible archaic or late paleo Indian age, which is, you know, 9,000 years plus or minus. Um, and so, uh, once again, it, it's just really a, a, a tragedy that this site has been uh, removed of a lot of its evidence. Right, so future work, um, either this summer or possibly later, around October, actually, uh, future work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Meg Van Ness will occur at the <coughs> Scott Miller site because it holds such a high potential for further research, uh, pre-Clovis and other Paleo-Indian time frames. Uh, some things that need to, must be conducted is that we did turn in carbon-14 dates for this, that bottom woody peat layer, but something went wrong. And so our dates were actually younger than the top ones, which makes no sense, so we're gonna have to redo that. And that bottom fluvial layer, we did not get carbon-14 dates for that. And since that's where a lot of the bones are and in these pebble circles and cobbles, it's really important that we actually get a date. Also, these uh, unique characteristics of pebble circles and cobbles being where these bones are found, it, there must be a connection with that. For the paleo wetland that typically is of low energy in these cobbles, uh, where the bones are found, it requires more energy. So that might be of some importance and should be further looked into next summer. 
Um, the Mr. Pete site, uh, once again, has lost a lot of material due to non-scientific excavation and collection. Um, one of the biggest questions that remains is, where are all these bones that we're finding on the surface of the bison and ticklus in the mammoth? What is the layer that these are coming from? Um, there's uh, some potential uh, research opportunities north of Highway 160. Um, it appears that this Mr. Pete site uh, continues. Uh, and that could be a good new research location. Perhaps there's some of the uh, archaeological material remaining more so than the Mr. Pete site. Also, um, it might be uh, maybe more remote uh, and therefore uh, of, of easier uh, accessibility for our science research versus uh, collectors. All right, any questions?